Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for checking into the 126 Area Fueling Wing Town Hall. This is the town hall with the uh, command staff, the 126 Area Fueling Wing. I welcome you to this stream and I want to let you know if you have any questions, if you have any concerns, if you have anything that you would like to pose to our command staff, then this is the forum, this is the space to do so. Uh, please like and share this stream and we look forward to hearing from you. And from there, I'd like to introduce you to our command staff. Thank you, thank you, Tess, appreciate that. <clears throat> well, as you know, welcome everybody. Uh, it's been unable to have a real commander's call since March. So what we decided to do was use this avenue as a way to get some information to everyone and share some ideas and thoughts and see where we're going and then also open it up to questions and comments uh, along the way. So with that, I'd like to start with 9-11. Uh, obviously, uh, most of us already know what today means, what 9-11 means and 19 years ago, how it changed all of our lives. Uh, I can't say enough uh, what this wing has done. Uh, we were discussing it just a little while ago, how just a few hours after those attacks, this wing was already mobilized, ready to go, and crews were airborne over Chicago, refueling uh, combat-coated aircraft that were loaded, uh, ready to support wing, uh, the, the mission of the wing and the defense of the United States. And ever since then, this wing has been involved in every single operation around the world. So it's a constant reminder to us that what we do every day uh, is directly related to what happened on 9-11. So hopefully you take time today to recognize that and remember those we lost on that day and, and those we've lost since. Since March, obviously the uh, COVID environment has been a part of our lives more than uh, any of us could ever have imagined. Uh, but since then, this wing has been an unbelievable supporter of uh, one of our also primary missions, which is the state support. Uh, since March, uh, right about March 12th, we had our first person deploy for state support. And since then, we've had 187 members of the wing deploy in support of state missions all around the state. Everything from operating testing centers to managing the Joint Force Headquarters. And uh, we've been a part of, uh, in part of uh, every operation throughout the state to support that. Uh, we've also supported the civil disturbance up in Chicago with 21 security forces members our, uh, <clears throat> and as well as election support uh, when we had the general election back in March with uh, four members supporting that. So once again, the, the Illinois Air National Guard has a federal mission and a state mission and we've been supporting both of those uh, the whole time. Um, leaning toward the federal mission, uh, we have, uh, this is our reserve component period, so throughout this year, since March, we have been departing or deploying personnel around the, around the world in support of uh, different combatant commands. So since March, uh, up until about uh, this week, we've had about 200 folks departing uh, that are all around the world, and uh, starting in early October, the first person actually starts to return. And they'll also be gone until about January, February of next year. Uh, so we have, uh, like I said, about 200 folks uh, around the world. <clears throat> Leading into February or April, May of 21, uh, where we'll be deploying again to the pa Pacific Theater Command <clears throat> and uh, supporting the uh, th forces out in that area, uh, both operations and maintenance group uh, supporting that. Just last month, the National Guard Association of the United States held its annual conference. Uh, in typical fashion, it was done virtually. Uh, done very well, but we got a chance to hear from all of the senior leaders, most of them new, meaning the Director of the Air National Guard, Chief Staff of the Air Force, etc. And uh, it was a really good opportunity to hear their words and talk to the Guard directly uh, of what the Air Guard is doing and where we're going and, and where we're at in the, in the world. A couple of highlights for the state of Illinois is uh, Illinois was highlighted as the leading state of growth for membership in August. Uh, we went from a 37% to 46% of the state as a member of the National Guard Association of the U.S., which is a huge, and we're the number one in the country to do that. Uh, and that was all based upon what has happened since about March time frame. So during all this you know, COVID experience, uh, the, the unit has really been participating well in our uh, supporting agencies. Also from the National Guard Association of the United States, we've won two uh, high-level awards. One is the Outstanding Flying Unit Award. This is the second year in a row the 126 has uh, won the Outstanding Flying Unit Award that is given to uh, the top five flying wings in the Air National Guard. That is, there are 90 flying wings in the Air National Guard and we are once again one of the top five and again we are the only air refueling wing in the top five. So that was pretty impressive uh, to do that two years in a row, uh, especially given all the stuff that we've been doing. Uh, it was a really a, an exciting experience. The other award we won was for a uh, an individual. Uh, that individual will be notified uh, in short order. So I'll keep that uh, close hold for now, but uh, <clears throat> pretty important that uh, we have a, a senior um, a 
an officer that was recognized nationally as a, a superior leader and uh, outstanding. Uh, and so it, it's a really exciting time for the Illinois Air National Guard in 126th. Um, moving on to our state partnership with Poland. Uh, that's one of our primary missions that we have here as well as uh, supporting the national defense strategy and the European Defense Initiative with our strategic partner, Poland. Uh, we've been slowly ramping up with that over the last several years. Uh, we did have to cancel a recent event uh, that was supposed to be deployed right now uh, due to the COVID experience got to going out in uh, Poland. They, they had some events going on and they decided to shut things down. So we, but we are departing again next week for another uh, event out there in Poland. So uh, the wing is going out to support that with uh, several members and supporting the uh, state partnership with Poland. Uh, <clears throat> as far as exercise and inspections, uh, obviously as we uh, kind of move toward the fall, we got to start getting back into our normal rhythm and uh, the things that we have to do every day, which is uh, education, experience, and, and building our skill sets for our exercises and inspections coming up. So leaning on inspections, the key uh, dates you're going to see in the future are uh, May, of, uh, May of 2021 is a large force readiness exercise, essentially an ORI type of situation where we're going to be uh, practicing our sea burning uh, and chem defense capabilities under the IG inspection uh, scenario. And then in July of next year is our unit effectiveness inspection, which will effectively close out the current UEI cycle. Uh, the good news about that is once we get that done, we are right into the next two cycle with a clean slate and it's time to kind of get back into the normal things. In order to execute those inspections, we've got several exercises that we're building up to. Uh, the LRE is going to drive a lot of support equipment, a lot of support agencies around the wing as we prepare for that ORI type experience, uh, as well as a nuclear generation exercise in November for uh, a significant portion of ops and maintenance. So lots of things happening, and we're going to have to do that all in a constrained, constrained environment, which we've all kind of done for a while now. But uh, the good news is that the wing is safe, the wing is healthy, and uh, we are doing really well here. I appreciate that. Uh, last couple things I want to touch on is, uh, I've, I've, as I've said before, this is Suicide Prevention and Awareness Month. Uh, it's a very important uh, thing that we always take a look at uh, and take care of our members. We do very well in this wing with the connectedness, making people feel like we are part of a family. And that's one thing the Guard has always been well known for is that we're a family. Um, I know Colonel Babiak and I and uh, Chief Douglas, we've been in this wing for decades and we have seen lots of folks come and go and, and we've grown up with a lot of these folks. So we are a family. And I can tell you from the, the newest airman to my most senior officer and airman in the, in the wing, uh, they are just as much as a family member as every one of my uh, immediate family. So uh, we do take care of our folks, but in light of suicide prevention and awareness, it takes a little bit of extra uh, thought, a little bit of extra time, and sometimes just talking to your friends and your coworkers uh, can make a difference. So keep that in your mind. Uh, you'll get a little bit more training on that this weekend and a little bit more exposure to that. But uh, once again, I just want to touch on that. The last thing I want to talk about is diversity and inclusion. Uh, it's obviously a <clears throat> hot topic. It's something we've all been talking about lately. Uh, as we get growing and uh, get moving on some of the things, uh, the headquarters staff and my Joint Diversity Executive Council has been at work for about three months now on moving forward on some policies and some plans moving forward on some ideas on how to engage and encourage an open line of communication for all of our personnel. Uh, but the big picture is uh, one thing we need to look at is from a demographic standpoint, the 126 is already very diverse. Uh, coming down from Chicago 21 years ago now, uh, we were kind of established already as a pretty diverse wing. And even down here in the Metro East, uh, we've established and maintained that diversity. And if you look around the wing from our, our senior leaders and senior enlisted all the way down to the airmen, we, we make sure that we uh, have, have a diverse and wide base of, uh, of folks that were all just not from recruiting, from recruiting all the way through uh, the promotions and the development of our leaders. Um, and we try to include everybody and in everything and get everybody the same opportunities and show them the path for uh, growth and leadership and improvement. So um, with that, um, thank you for your time. I'm gonna go ahead and give it back to Cess. Hopefully we have some questions and, uh, and if you have anything, please also uh, shoot it up on the comments and we'll, we'll answer them up. So Cess, you're up. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, my very first question I'm going to direct to you, Colonel Jackson. Oh, very commander. good. Um, how has, has becoming wing commander changed your outlook of the wing? 
Well, interesting. Um, once again, I'll refer back to uh, being a member of the swing now for 31 and a half years. Um, I've, I've been able to see it grow from uh, what we had in Chicago to what we have now, and, and see I've seen a lot of different areas of the wing. Um, I started in maintenance. Uh, I went to operations. I've had a couple of stints in various wing staff agency jobs too. So I've got a chance to see the wing from a lot of different angles, uh, including the wing inspector general and wing plans, which was really the gave me an opportunity to see everybody in the wing from an inspection standpoint. So I already knew what the wing was capable of, and I already had a really good idea of the membership and the, the culture and that kind of thing. So it didn't really change that much. But what really changed my mind was, or kind of really set the tone for me was uh, March 12th when I had to shut down the wing after only being open for about five, being in command for about five days. And without missing a beat, uh, we had about 100 folks lined up, volunteered, ready to go for whatever call was going to come because we knew it was coming. And bar none, uh, I did not have a challenge filling any task that was asked of us. So uh, I really got a chance to see firsthand and very quickly the willingness of this wing and the membership to support whatever was asked. And that was uh, very, very... Uh, and heart, heartening for me. Uh, mm -hmm. As a commander, it's, it's good to see. And I've gotten some really good feedback from uh, not only state personnel, but uh, the governor of Illinois. So it's pretty, it's pretty exciting. Yeah. Yes, sir. All right, thank you for that response. Colonel Badiak, our second question is for you. Why is our support of the Illinois State Partnership Program important? Well, first off, it's a, uh, a TAG-directed program. Um, it's also in uh, direct support of USAFE and UCOM uh, strategic priorities. It's in line with the uh, EDI, which postures our wing to deter a near-peer uh, adversary. Um, it gets some of the highest visibility at NGB, um, as well as the Pentagon. Um, so I'd say it's very important. Yes, sir. All right, and uh, thank you for that answer, sir. Chief Douglas, this next question is for you, sir. <coughs> are, uh, are community college of the Air Force degrees required for senior NCO promotions? And uh, there's a part two to this question. How vital is having a degree for enlisted career progression? Okay. Uh, recently, there was a change to the, uh, uh, the instruction on whether a community college of the Air Force uh, degree was required for a promotion, and they changed it to now instead of having to have a CCAF, you're allowed to have an equal degree from a, uh, a college such as uh, SWIC here or a community college elsewhere. So now that kind of opens up the uh, aperture for people in the Guard and Reserves who do have degrees from these places. So it's, it, they kind of ease that uh, requirement. You still do have to have a degree that's com comparable to a CCAF, but you don't have to have the CCAF. Uh, as far as education, uh, could you repeat the second question just, to, just so I make sure they get Absolutely, absolutely. So the second part is how vital is having a degree for an enlisted career progression in a, to, to get promoted to move on? Uh, the way I look at it is I look at the people, the, the senior enlisted leaders, and, and take time to look at their bios and see that most of the senior enlisted leaders that you, you look up to are, are you know, the, the chief of uh, the command chief master sergeant of the Air Force, the uh, Command Chief, Master Sergeant of the Air National Guard. When you look at their bios, they do have uh, degrees, whether it be a bachelor's degree or a master's degree, and, and they do have their Community College of the Air Force degree. So apparently, you know, it, it is a, you know, it's it's not a mandate, but uh, most of them that you look at their bios, they will have some type of degree, you know, past the uh, associate or past the uh, Community College of the Air Force degree. So it it, it is a, a an, in, or, uh, an enhancer. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you get up into some of the senior levels, uh, you're going to be working with people who do have advanced degrees and, and so forth. And uh, it, it, it does help uh, when when it's uh, some of the, those positions are chosen or whatever. So it is uh, definitely a plus. Helpful. Okay. Thank you, sir. Colonel Jackson, next question is for okay. you. This one's a little bit lengthy, so bear with me. Air Force, Chief, Air Force Chief of Staff General Brown wrote in his Accelerate Change or Lose paper, if we are to succeed, we must accelerate the change necessary for us to remain the most dominant and respected Air Force in the world. What does this mean for the 126? So 
Yeah, that was a great paper. Uh, so accelerate, change, or lose. That means it, 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 a lot of times people think the military doesn't want to change because that's the way we've always done it. Uh, I can tell you that uh, that is a, a term that when I hear that, I immediately say, oh, hold on, that means you need to change probably. That's, mm -hmm. that's my usual response. Um, because things are so much different right now, and just in the constrained environment we have right now, we have to do things differently just simply to operate. And we're proving that just, for example, this weekend and every drill weekend we've had for the last three months is we've changed the way we've operated and we're doing more than most guard wings because we have to. And uh, so if we don't accelerate that change and make it happen and do the things differently that need to be done, then we are unable to compete and not be able to uh, match what other, even other guard units are doing, other active duty units are doing. And as they start to progress and they start to grow and they start to improve, then we need to do the same and we need to do it better because we have better people and like the chief said uh, we have a lot of folks with advanced degrees who are very happy turning wrenches on an airplane and that's great we love that um, but they're very very skilled at what they do so we're able to adapt and change and move much quicker than than most units and, uh, and that's that's been a plus for us so we encourage that we encourage the the ability to, to innovate and the ability to change and ability to adapt and try something new uh, and if it doesn't work, then we just go, okay, well, that didn't work. Now we know what we know, and we can move on to something different and, and try to make it better. That's very good insight. Thank you, sir. All right. And so, Colonel Levy, do you see our missions to Poland, do you see our missions with Poland increasing? Um, on, on a senior level uh, engagement, you may see uh, some increase, but as far as the aviation detachment rotations and the large force exercises like Balt Ops and Astral Night, uh, we feel that our line of effort there is sufficient. Um, current goal is for a combination of any of those two uh, to have it quarterly uh, for the next calendar year. Um, that will depend, of course, uh, year to year on the other operational constraints that we have and what white space we have on the schedule. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Um, I want to remind <coughs> everyone that's watching right now, you can feel free to pose any questions, any comments, any concerns. Go ahead and post that below in the, uh, in the comment bar. And I'm moderating, I'm moderating, and uh, I'm, I'm watching that, so we can ask those questions here. <laughs> All right. Moving right along, so Chief Douglas, are in-residence PME classes opening again, and are they preferred over online or correspondence classes? Okay, I just uh, spoke with uh, our training office this morning and asked them about uh, what was going on with our PME courses and Master Sergeant Schaefer advised me that the the change has come about. In August, we submitted a list of names of people who were requesting the in-residence courses. And so the, as the training lines drop at this time of the year, those people were selected that uh, do get chosen to go in residence. He said the uh, change is now they're having their giving the people, it's kind of a virtual classroom or a virtual course where uh, the people are actually given days, which they're on Title 10 orders to complete this, but they're expected to report to a virtual classroom and be present for, for the training. So they're doing it from home. It's a, kind of an adapted version of the uh, PME, so they don't actually go to whatever base. They stay at their home do it from home, but they're given orders, so they're being paid, and that's what their job is for that time, just kind of like going in residence. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's an adapted version. Yeah, it's uh, just as the colonel's question was, change. We had to change to, to meet the need, and what they did was change the course. They're giving it to them a, in a new type of environment, but it is basically an in, in residence, but they're just meeting online to, to do that. So. Uh, as far as the second part, are they uh, preferred over the uh, correspondence or online? Uh, some of the things you, you get from an in-residence are, uh, the enhancements of that are, say, the, the questions and answers from inside the class. When you're looking at a book, you get the same material, yet there's no question and answer. You're just going through it at your own. And, and you, you develop relationships with other people in the classes and so forth. So you, you do get that uh, 
relationship building and also you do get a little extra add-on and that's my my opinion is is you get the extra add-on from the class questions and you don't get that so much you, you get the material but you don't get those little nuggets of information that come in from the side questions and so forth but so they they both meet the goal or meet the the, the mission need but if you have an opportunity to go in residence you know, I would encourage people to apply and, and attempt to get one of those seats just because of the little added nuggets that mm -hmm. you kind of get that uh, you wouldn't get from just reading a book or looking at something online, so to speak. And, and hopefully these uh, courses that they're doing online, when everybody's online together, they kind of uh, get those nuggets and that they build some relationships with other people around the country so that uh, it, it just helps us as a wing and helps us as an Air National Guard. So. Yes, sir. I definitely you. see that being valuable. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Colonel Jackson, our next question is for right, you, sir. sir. Um, under what circumstances, if any, may telecommuting be allowed in the future? Well, given the current constraints, <clears throat> I foresee the current processes, the way we do business, uh, continuing for the foreseeable future. <clears throat> so uh, when you respond to telework, for example, I, th I think that's always going to be an option. And once again, I'll relate that right back to the change question, is mm -hmm. that this has been something we've been working on for quite a while in small little pieces to test it and see how it works. And we've been forced into realizing that it actually is pretty effective in some cases. So we've taken the good and we kept it, and we're actually going to grow on that. And we've taken the bad and said, eh, that maybe that didn't work so well. So teleworking is probably going to be part of our uh, operational toolbox for quite a while. And uh, alternate work schedules, as long as there are constraints out in the you know, civilian world with uh, families at school and school children not being able to go to school and, uh, or you know, kids not being able to go to college, those kind of things, then we will have to adjust for the families as well, for our, for our own workers to get that done. So once again, it's just the adaptive lifestyle that we have to have, uh, but ultimately the mission will have to occur and we'll ju we're just working around to get it happen. So. Adapting mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly, well said. Thanks, sir. Um, Colonel Babia, do you think we'll see the return of flyaway exercises? And do our home station exercise exercises provide the same quality of training? Um, there has been a discussion about uh, doing that kind of training um, and evaluation off-site. Currently, we feel that um, with both the uh, facilities and training locations that we have here on our campus, along with the, um, the training and uh, facilities and locations that, that our, our mission partners have offered up, that we can, we can still craft a, a robust uh, exercise and inspection scenario. Um, you just have to keep in mind that when you do talk about going off station, that uh, it incurs a, a certain cost to the unit, um, both uh, monetarily and then also with the airman's time. So it's a matter of balancing those two to decide what's best. So uh, stand by for updates in the future. All right, very good, mm -hmm. thank you, sir. Um, we are about at our 30 minute mark. I want to thank everyone for staying along with us. And uh, we, have, uh, we have a few more questions yet, so we'd like to extend if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to, great. All right, Chief Douglas. What book have you recently read that you would recommend, or audiobook, podcast, TED Talk, et cetera? Uh, one of my <coughs> recent ones was uh, Nine Minutes on Monday by James Robbins. And it just uh, encourages leaders to spend a few minutes on the, the, their Monday of their week as to who, you know, to, to remind them to mentor, the, the, their responsibility of mentorship, of caring, and, and so forth. So it just makes you reflect on some of those things. And, you know, it, it talks about uh, doing your walkabouts in, in the office and, and recognizing people for their anniversary days and, and talking to people, making sure that you become a person and that you realize that they're, they're not just a, a, a workhorse for you, so to speak, that they actually are part of your family, as the Colonel said, you know, it, it, it make them feel that they're welcome and that, that when you can recognize and ask somebody about their uh, child, how their kid's doing and, and so forth, it just goes a long way and, and you know, to, to remind people that of <coughs> some of the other Options that are other other things that we get from our our job, you know, and he, he goes into talking about the second paycheck because we all work for our paycheck, but what's the second paycheck that we we get, you know, and 
some of that is where, hey, you know, I, I get to work with these people and, and I get to, to, to glean off of, uh, you know, uh, taking care of other airmen or, or whatever, you know, so it's, it's not just your paycheck, so, so to speak, as the money, but the, the internal recognition that people get from, you know, helping somebody and so forth. So it, it goes into to that, and, and, and it just, it's, you know, any leadership book, you know, there's always a lot of the, the same nuances and, and so forth in the book. But it just, one of the things I liked about it was it says, you know, just start off your week, the beginning of the week and look through these things and make sure that you're doing some of these things so that you go from just managing people where, where it is and that you look at your people as real people not just little pawns that you're you're working around that you're, you're you, you realize that they have lives and they have and, and in this environment that we're working in now there's a lot of uh, moving pieces and, and things that are in place today that maybe change tomorrow just like the, <laughs> the the people with the schooling of their children today they're going to class next week they may be doing a virtual thing and their their work life has to be adjusted to to do it so it's, it's those things that just make you realize that people are real and that we have to take care of them and when we take care of our people that's how our mission gets taken care of so yes sir okay acknowledging the human side of the force and right us out as a whole right I like that Thank very good so much. uh colonel jackson what yes, sir what uh, are your priorities, sir, for the wing? So priorities, yeah. Um, <clears throat> protecting the force is number one right now. Um, and back in March when I took command, that was one of the first things I sat down with my command staff, and I said, what are the priorities of the wing? And uh, due to the uh, uh, kind of building pandemic at the time and the way we shut down, was protecting the force was far and away the number one thing. So we shut down. But over time, we kind of had to move that. And I'm not going to say protecting the force has come down in priority. But executing the mission has gone up. That's why about May, mid-May, early May, we had to start flying again. We had to get our crews ready to fly. We had to get maintenance ready because we were deploying. We were, we were sending those folks into a combat environment. They need to be ready. So the mission execution needed to come up. And I would say right now, the balance between, just like Colonel Babiak said, with uh, the airman's time and deploying off for an off-station sortie is, is what's the balance? What's that risk management I have to do between executing the mission, getting things done, while still protecting the force? We've, I think we've struck a really good balance here. I think we've taken all the procedures we can here. Um, and then uh, growing airmen is very, very high for me. Um, none of us in the senior leadership positions are going to be here very long. So I need to make sure that uh, number two, three, and four, and ten levels down uh, know that they, they could be in the seat at some point. And they need to know what needs to be done as a brand new airman to make sure that they can be a staff sergeant. And I need to know what a tech sergeant needs to know so he can be a first sergeant or the master needs to know what he can be a chief. If I don't do those things, uh, the wing's timeline is limited because the leadership won't be there. Uh, the good news is I think uh, we've done a great job of building those leaders around the wing, but there's always more we can do. There's always other people who get their eyes opened to know that, wow, I, I don't have to stay in maintenance group. I can go to another group and learn something new and, and grow and be a better leader and learn more things about the wing, then, then that's what we're doing. So we're opening the doors and, and things like that. So. Uh, definitely mission execution, protecting the force, and then uh, uh, building uh, future leaders. Those, those are my keys. Yes, mm -hmm. okay. That sounds pretty good. Um, I, miscalculated, I miscalculated a little bit, and I, I said that we were uh, we were about to go over time. I uh, didn't take into account that we started our pre-roll just to let people know that we're about to go live. <laughs> so uh, now we're we're about we're about at our uh, at our thirty minute mark. Okay. That was our uh, that was our last question that I have available uh, okay. before. Uh, before I send this off, I would like to open it up uh, in this uh, in this forum in this this moment that we have right now. Is there anything the leadership would like to uh, say to uh, our viewing audience? I'll just open up the floor. Chief, how about you? Anything extra you want to say? Uh, I just want to thank everybody for their efforts, and I know there's been a lot of people who have gone over and above, especially with some of the, doing some of these. Uh, state missions and, and stepping up into the unknown. It was something that we haven't done, a pandemic, and it's kind of eye-opening and, and, and looking you in the face of, of stuff that you're not used to. You know, we're used to going off and doing our AEFs and, and doing whatever, but this was something totally kind mm -hmm. of new, and the people that did it, uh, kudos to you, and the people that stepped up back here at the wing and, and, and did their part for getting people out the door and for continuing the mission of the, the wing, hey, great job, and uh, to our people who are deployed, 
you know, thank you for all the things you do. And, and remember to say that we thank you and your family because without your family, uh, you can't do the do your job. And uh, if there's anything you need from us, uh, never hesitate to reach out to us and, and ask us. And there's somebody in the wing that can uh, help with the problem or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. We can find you the the resources that you need. You know, especially you know, like they say, if somebody's grass needs mowed. There's somebody that probably lives fairly close to them and uh, can take care of it for them or, or whatever. It's, it's don't hesitate to ask because when you let those little things build up, it becomes a big thing. So remember that we're here for you and uh, we appreciate all you do. So thank you. Thank you. Are we good? All right. So Nick. Do, you, uh, do you have anything else to add uh, just to our form at home? Yeah, I guess I'd just like to reiterate uh, what uh, the link commander um, kind of stated about uh, mentorship and building a bench. Um, he and I, uh, wing leadership, uh, feel very strongly about that, um, mostly um, because it's the right thing to do, but personally because as young airmen working on airplanes, we were both the recipients of, of great mentorship. Um, so if there's a young airman out there right now, um, take the time to mentor him. And if you are that young airman that's out there, um, take the opportunities that you have because you never know, you might end up one day being the wing commander. <laughs> Um, I actually do have a have a couple a couple quick comments. Oh. Uh, they're not questions. They're just they're comments. Great. Bring them. Shoot them. Um, we we have a viewer that said 126 rocked COVID response. <laughs> said that we did a good job. Uh, we have another comment that says thank you for going above and beyond and being available for our people. Open support and communication from the top helps our members feel less in the dark during these interesting times. Mm. Interesting times it is. <laughs> yes. Sir. I guess. All well, right. thank you, uh, PA team. Uh, excellent job. I, I can't tell you how much you guys have been a part of my key team since March 12th. Uh, there's no way I could communicate as well uh, without your guys' support. Uh, Facebook pages, social media, uh, email, uh, everything under the sun. Uh, I just call you guys and boom, it's done. So outstanding with that. Um, I, I can't thank the, the leadership team enough too. And like they said, uh, even though a lot of us were sequestered, we were, we were we were kind of locked away in houses for a while and slowly coming back to work. Um, I always knew I had some folks out there that were working hard no matter where they were. And uh, um, I will say this, I'll close out with uh, recruiting. The 126 is hiring a lot. We have some spots. So no matter where you want to be a pilot, you want to work in PA, you want to do work on airplanes, uh, you want to work in medical, you name it, we probably have the skill set that you would like to have uh, or at least learn or be part of. And uh, we, we would love to have you as part of our team. Uh, we're always growing, and we're always looking to you know, hire on some great people, and I know, you know they're out there. So uh, thanks again for everybody uh, logging in and checking on, and uh, feel free to keep posting comments to it later, and we'll get back to them at another time, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll answer them up. So thanks again, everybody. Back to you. All right. Um, I, want to, uh, I want to thank all of, our, all of our leadership. Thank you so much for this uh, opportunity uh, to, make, uh, to, to make your voices heard. And I, I know that uh, not, only, not only me, but... There are many other people who really appreciate it, just like uh, what was already what was already voiced. So I'm glad you put that plug in. <laughs> we do have spots in public affairs that are available. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for watching. Uh, make sure to like and share. Follow our page. And if you know anyone that might be interested in this opportunity, uh, the Illinois Air National Guard, then feel free to share that opportunity with them. I want to thank all of our viewers for watching, and we look forward to seeing you next time. of the United States Air Force is to fly, fight, and win in air, space, and cyberspace. To achieve this mission, the Air Force has a vision of global vigilance, reach, and power. We use technologically advanced aircraft to complete missions worldwide, which comes with a variety of logistical challenges. Fuel is one such challenge. To achieve global vigilance, our aircraft need enough fuel to reach their destinations. However, the more fuel they carry limits the number of weapons, troops, and cargo on board. Aerial refueling gives these aircraft virtually unlimited range and maximum payload capability. Our wing's mission is a critical part of today's global military operation.